morning everyone and a very warm welcome to our time of worship here in the sanctuary of New Relief Church. Uh, wherever you're joining with us, whether you're here in person or joining with us uh, online, I trust that you will find the joy of the Lord as we share in our worship together. As you know, we're, we're lighting the, the Advent candles each week. There are four candles, not fork candles. I was trying to avoid <laughs> four candles, each one representing the Sundays uh, running up before Christmas. Um, the purple ones are for hope, love and peace. And the pink or the rose one uh, represents joy. So, who is coming up today? Is it Molly and Grace? It is. It's not an adult that's doing it. Right. We're going to light this one. That's it. Well done. Thank you very much. Well done. So as all the candles are lit today, let's join in prayer. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, let the joy of the Lord fill us as we lean on you, our wonderful counsellor, our mighty God, our everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. Help us to look with expectation to what you will do in our life and fill us with your joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So thank you for doing that. That was excellent. Um, it's time for the intimations. But before we, we do so, Amanda's going to come up and explain a little about the candlelit. Hi folks, just a wee bit, a wee quick, I will not be too, too long, um, about crossing together in the candlelit parade. It kind of started as an idea, um, obviously the past 18 months have been horrendous for for people within our communities um, and crossing together is a really hard job trying to bring the community together at a time when we've not been able to, to, to come together. Um, so the, the candlelit parade is a chance to try and reach out, do a wee bit of that mission work and it, it's about spreading, spreading the good news that, that, that Jesus is here um, and really it's, it's a nativity walk. So we've got the candles um, we're going to be singing some carols, we've got some music, um, we're encouraging everybody to come with tinsel, Christmas jumpers, uh, Harvey's, I think you've got a wise man outfit, yeah, so Harvey's going to magic, um, I've got a, 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 a flashing halo, because obviously I'm very angelic, um, so there's, there's all these, all these good things, so it's just to encourage you to maybe tell your, your you know, your grandkids, your kids, your family members to try and encourage people to support and we're still looking for volunteers to be able to help make some hot chocolate so even if you're not wanting to necessarily go out in the cold and to maybe do the wee walk and it's in the library up to the church and it's not that far and um, we're still very much looking for volunteers to help make um, our hot chocolate and give out our wee mince pies and chocolate logs and, and things so as I say, it's just, just a wee pop that it's on this Wednesday. It starts at 6.30 at um, the library. But if anybody is willing to help, please come and let me know. But Alison's number and things is available. If you contact her and we'll, we'll be in the church probably for about half five or onwards for your time. And it won't be that that long. By the time we walk up um, and we, we sing a few carols, have some hot chocolate outside. So I'm really hoping to see as many people as, as possible or yet your families and friends. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's an online reflection this Wednesday at 2.15 
Uh, unfortunately, the friendly hour is, is cancelled, uh, I think due to concerns over the situation with COVID at the moment. All articles for the January edition of the magazine should be sent to David by Sunday the 26th of December. Just a quick reminder of the Christmas services, there's a Christingle family service here in the West Road Sanctuary at 7pm on Christmas Eve, and followed later in the evening by the Watch Night service at 11.30. Uh, Please note that although the service starts at 11.30, you're very welcome to come a little bit earlier as we're going to be singing carols from quarter past 11 onwards. Uh, it would be a huge help to Morag if you could please email uh, any intimations you have by Thursday of the week. The Scouts are urgently looking for more people to become leaders or, or helpers as the numbers attending are increasing. So if you are interested, then please speak to Morag or Carl. Uh, there's a quick session meeting uh, immediately after the morning worship on Sunday the 19th of December. Huge thanks to those who have donated toys or gifts for our toy service this morning. That is a fantastic uh, display and I'm sure uh, those who receive these will be absolutely delighted. So well done. Uh, it really is fantastic. The flower list for next year is now available in the vestibule if anyone wants to add their name to it. We're still looking for a disability champion from the congregation. Someone who can liaise uh, between our church and presbytery. Uh, Katrona Templeton is the mission pioneer for Reach Out Together. This is the presbytery-wide mission aim to enable people with disabilities to engage fully uh, in church life, including worship and service and fellowship. So if you're interested in getting involved in that, uh, please speak to Morag or David. And finally, please join with us after the service for a cup of tea or coffee, a biscuit and a blether. You'll all be most welcome to come along. Let's begin our worship as we stand together and sing from the church hymnary number 306 will come all ye faithful and we'll only sing the first three verses number 306 
Let's take a moment to quieten our hearts and our minds before we come to God in prayer. Let's pray. Oh Lord God, we come into your house this morning. We come in the sure and certain knowledge that you are here with us. That you're always with us. Always aware of our needs and our thoughts. And you invite us to be with you, to be near you. Your presence is our joy. It's our light and our comfort. And your nearness to us is a, a wonderful gift whether it's in the warmth of the sunlight or in the sounds of music and laughter, in the touch of friends and loved ones, or in the sweet scent of blessed blossom, your presence is known. But also in the moments of darkness, in the silence and in the solitude, in times of fear and in the bitterness of tears, you're with us and your presence surrounds us. O oh, glorious God, we, we lift our hearts and our voices in response to your love. We raise our songs of praise to your goodness. We offer our adoration in response to your holiness. As we come before you this morning, we realize that we have our faults, that we have our limitations. We recognize our mistakes and our sins. And as we worship at your throne, we come to you for forgiveness. As we turn away from the darkness into the light. We rejoice that despite our failings, you still welcome us and, and you greet us with a smile. You forgive and renew. You give us new hope and new life. So speak to us now, breath of God. Forgive us for the many times when we've hidden behind our weaknesses, ignoring your power, ignoring your presence. Call us, voice of God, with words that challenge. Call us to be your disciples and to bear witness to your love. We praise and adore you, our great and wonderful God. So we ask that you would receive our worship now as we come to you in the name of Jesus, the one who taught us to pray and to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, my young friends. How are you this morning? Do you want to come up onto the red carpet with me? Come on up, and we can have a seat. Come on up. How are you? Good. Good. Nice to see you girls. Ah, oh, here's trouble. Excellent. Just what I need. No, I'm only kidding. It's great. It's nice to see you. Can I ask you a question this morning? Okay. What is it? You probably need to look at everyone out there. Okay, so just have a wee look at it. What is it that we all have in common? What is it that we all have? That's one thing, but let me explain. What is it that we all have? Some of us have two. Some of us have three. Some of us have four. What could that be? Have a look and see. If... No. Not everyone does have children. Have a look and see. What, what can you see? that everyone has in common. Mm. Any guesses? Surely I haven't stumped you this week. <laughs> Christmas jumpers? 
Yeah, but not everyone's got a Christmas tree. A good guess, but not everyone's got one. No, not all have got Christmas. This is great. Masks. Well, yes, almost everyone has a mask, but how many are they wearing? One. They're more than one, but they're not wearing more than one. What do you think it might be? Any guesses from out there? Anyone? Have I stumped you all this week? I get a bonus prize for that. What do you think it is? Hair? Well, no, not all of us. There are some of us who just have no hair at all. There's nobody here like that, so we're okay. Oh, sorry. No, no, we're no. <laughs> we do have hair. I know, we all have hair. Right, no, it's not that. It is a name. It wasn't that exciting, really, was it, after all? Yes, we all have a name. Most of us have two. Some of us have three. Some people have four. Let's just have a look. Put your hands up. This is goes us here if you've got two names. A first name and a last name. Yes, okay. Put your hand up if you've got three names. Oh, well done. Oh, a lot of posh people here. Right. Hands up if you've got four names. <gasps> wow. That's amazing. Surely nobody's got five names. And a hyphen. No. <laughs> Wow! You've got two names. I've got three names. Except sometimes my big brothers would give me a few other names. They would give me a nickname. Do you know what my brothers used to call me? Half pint. Half pint. It doesn't make any. I said that. It doesn't make any sense either. Well, I know. And then they called me Wee Man. I think they were suggesting that I was a little small. But it wasn't very nice, was it? It's not nice when people give you toys. But to us, you better. Thank you so much. You can come again. Thank you. To us and Big. That's nice. I'm going to write that on my wall when I go home. Thank you so much. But some people give you names that are nice. They're nicknames. Does anyone have a nickname? A nice nickname? Yes, what's yours? Casey? Casey. Oh, that's a lovely name. Moles. Yeah, excellent. I used to get called yeah. Rory instead of Rory. That's strange. Do you know something? That's confusing, isn't it? I used to get called Suave Gav. Oh, no. I think that was my brother's as well. They used to do that. Now, we all have a name. Some of us have a few names. Some of us have special names. There's a man in the Bible a long time ago called Isaiah. And he was a prophet. And he would tell what was going to happen in the future. And he told the people then that God was going to come as a little baby. As a baby boy. Which is what we celebrate at Christmas. But... What's his name? Jesus. Jesus, yes. But do you know any of Jesus' other special names? Does anyone else know? There's four of them. Well, that's one. That wasn't the one I was thinking of, but that's a good. So there's five of them. I even wrote them down so that I wouldn't forget. Wonderful counselor. Okay, that's a step for a hint. Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Isaiah said that those are the special names that are going to be given to Jesus, God's Son, when he comes to the earth to the fire. Am I putting you to sleep? I can understand that. Jesus has four special names. Okay? He's Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and 
Prince of Peace. Those are mice names, and they're special names given to a special child. Now, I would like you to see if you can remember them every time you remember Jesus' name, if you can remember the four special names that were given to Jesus. Okay, let's say five. We'll go with five. What are they? Right, what was that? Emmanuel. Yep. Well, was that yours? What was the first one? One. Everlasting God. Everlasting Father. That was close. Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God. Excellent. Everlasting Father. And the last one was... Well done. I'm going to see next week. If you can remember those, I'm going to see next week. If I can remember those, you can write them down on a piece of paper as well. Please go back to your seats. It was nice to meet you again this morning. We're going to sing a song together. A song that reminds us that even though Jesus was poor, even though he was born in a stable and slept on the straw that was used for the animals, He was still the Prince of Glory and the Saviour of the world, Saviour to all of us. So let's stand and sing from the church hymnary number 310. See him lying in a bed of straw, number 310.
now Jennifer is going to come up and read for us this morning. Good morning. Our reading, readings this morning come from the book of Isaiah, that's chapter 9, verses 1 to 7, and then we're going to read from Matthew, chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. So Isaiah, chapter 9, first of all. There will be no way for them to escape from this time of trouble. The land of the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali was once disgraced, but the future will bring honour to this region from the Mediterranean eastwards to the land on the other side of the Jordan and even to Galilee itself, where the forgiveners live. The foreigners live, sorry. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. They lived in a land of shadows but now light is shining on them. You have given them great joy, Lord. You have made them happy. They rejoice in what you have done, as people rejoice when they harvest their corn or when they divide captured wealth. For you have broken the yoke that burdened them and the rod that beat their shoulders. You have defeated the nation that oppressed and exploited your people just as you defeated the army of Midian long ago. The boots of the invading army and all their blood-stained clothing will be destroyed by fire. A child is born to us, a son is given to us, and he will be our ruler. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. His royal power will continue to grow. His kingdom will always be at peace. He will rule as King David's successor, basing his power on right and justice from now until the end of time. The Lord Almighty is determined to do all this. Then on to Matthew 1, verses 18. The birth of Jesus Christ. This was how the birth of Jesus Christ took place. His mother Mary was engaged to Joseph, but before they were married, she found out that she was going to have a baby by the Holy Spirit. Joseph was a man who always did what was right, but he did not want to disgrace Mary publicly, so he made plans to break the engagement privately. While he was thinking about this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, descendant of David, do not be afraid to take Mary to be your wife, for it is by the Holy Spirit that she has conceived. She will have a son and you will name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Now, all this happened in order to make what the Lord had said through the prophet come true. A virgin will become pregnant and have a son, and he will be called Emmanuel, which means God is with us. So when Joseph woke up, he married Mary, and the angel of the Lord, as the angel of the Lord had told him to do. But he had had no sexual relations with her before she gave birth to her son, and Joseph named him Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jennifer. That was lovely. Let's sing again from Mission Praise, uh, number 233. His name is higher, and we'll sing this through twice.
Let's pray. O Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of your presence, open the mind of God to us, that in your light we may see the light, and in your strength be strong. Amen. So, what's the best Christmas present you've ever had? What's the best Christmas present you've ever been given? I'm sure you must have won. Best Christmas present you've ever been given. I read the other day uh, about a lady who was in her 90s, and she realized that going shopping for Christmas presents for a family was getting just a wee bit too difficult for her to do. So when Christmas time came, she decided that instead of getting them all presents, she'd simply put a check in with her Christmas cards, along with a wee explanation so that they could buy something nice for themselves. Well, she wrote out her Christmas cards, and at the bottom of each one, she lovingly wrote a short message and then sent them off in the post. A few weeks later, after the Christmas celebrations were over, she discovered the checks that she'd written were all still in her kitchen drawer. Each of her family and friends had received a lovely Christmas card from her, but with no check and a message inside that said, buy your own Christmas present. <laughs> oh dear. We all like gifts, don't we? We like receiving them from those we love, and we also enjoy giving them. For many of us, our gift list is perhaps a little bit limited. We may well have a long list of people we'd love to buy a Christmas present for, but we just don't have the money to do it. We can't give to everyone, but God can, and God has. For there is no one who's been left off of God's Christmas lift list. In verse 6 of chapter 9, Isaiah says, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. And he goes on to say, The government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Imagine for a moment that your front doorbell rang last night, okay? Just as you were about to sit down and watch Strictly, your front doorbell rings. You get up, you put your slippers on, and you go to the front door. And as you peer through the glass, you realize nobody's there. But then you look down, and you notice there's a small basket on your step. There's a small basket with a blanket covering the contents. What could it be? Carefully, you open the door, you bring the basket inside, and lift off the blanket. What do you find? You find a little baby boy and a note attached to the basket that says, I know it's a bit early, but Merry Christmas. Well, imagine if that actually happened. How would you respond? What would you do? Would you say, oh wow, that's what I've always wanted? Perhaps you would wonder why someone picked on your doorstep. Would you think, you know, actually, I'm too old for this, or... I don't have the time, or actually I don't have any room, or, well, actually I suspect that most of us could come up with a couple of dozen reasons why we couldn't take the baby. This morning, Isaiah kind of does the same thing to us, but spiritually. He lays a baby at the door of our heart. And he says, here you go. 
For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. Now, as you know, Christmas is, is not a story about another baby being born to a couple of nervous first-time parents. It's the account of how God, that's the God of all creation, was given to each and every one of us. It's the story of a gift from God that God is laying at your doorstep, and He wants to know how are you going to respond. The words of Isaiah at the beginning of chapter 9 are meant to be this big encouragement to God's people. Isaiah is pointing them towards a change that will be made, a change from the darkness of the past to the light of the future, to a time when God's holy child will come to put sin and darkness to the sword. He's pointing towards a time when this child will provide great hope and joy, because he's going to break the hold of sin. He's going to break the hold that sin has over us. And with that in mind, it's, it's kind of no surprise, therefore, that Isaiah says that this is a special child, and he will be given the highest praise and honor, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Isaiah explains why God will give his Son, and he speaks to us about who God is and what he will do. And so this morning, we're going to think briefly about these huge honors and titles which were given to this tiny child, this baby boy who was put at our doorstep. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. There was a time when we were lost and in need of someone. We needed someone to lead us to hope. And so God provided a wonderful counselor. In verse 4, Isaiah compares this to, he says, the day of Midian's defeat. He compares it to a time when God's people were lost and in need of someone to lead them to hope, to a time when God provided Gideon for the people. Isaiah is thinking back to a time when the Israelites were, as usual, making a mess of things with God, and for a number of years the Midianites had ruled over them. You know, the Midianites were hard and oppressive, so much so that the people of Israel would run and hide from them any time they appeared. They would run into the mountains and hide. And whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites would invade the country and ruin their crops. They would just swoop in with all their livestock, and like a swarm of locusts, they would ravage the land. And it was then that God called Gideon to deliver the people. We thought about the story a few weeks ago about how Gideon defeated the thousands of Midianites with just a few hundred men, how they blew their trumpet and chased all the Midianites away. Isaiah uses this historical illustration of how God will bring about another victory in the future. And he mentions something about a yoke, a yoke that is a burden. In Isaiah's day, this yoke would have been those who were threatening to invade their country. But looking at the bigger picture, Isaiah is really referring to a much heavier yoke, a yoke that we all bear, the yoke of sin. And Isaiah knows that sin works a bit like the Midianite army. Sin surrounds us. 
It takes us away from God. It makes us want to run to the hills too. It makes us want to hide in shame and embarrassment. There's nothing we can do about sin on our own. We're not strong enough to deal with it on our own. And friends, today sin is so very, very subtle. It attacks us on the television. It attacks us on the internet. It attacks us at our work, in our family. It attacks us when we're at rest at home. And when you think about it, the yoke of sin is even worse than that of the yoke of the Midianites, because we can't hide from it. There's nowhere that we can go that sin can't get us. The real issue for folks today is that, sadly, they don't think they're doing anything wrong. And if you can't see that you have a problem, then all this is it's just a nice story about a baby being born at Christmas time in a stable. And so they say yeah, the story of baby Jesus is it's lovely. Oh yes, that's lovely. Now, what do I want for Christmas? What about giving me something that I can eat or, or drink? something that I can watch or play with. It's only when you realize that sin is not something that you can ignore, it's, it's something that you're born into, when you realize that you need someone to lead you to hope, it's then that you should be sitting at the edge of your pew, desperate to see what kind of gift you are going to be given. Jesus tells us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Because God planned from the beginning to make our salvation completely dependent on the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, this wonderful counselor, this Son of God, who says, believe in me and be saved. Later in chapter 44, Isaiah goes on to tell of a time when the Israelites turn their back on God, a time when they begin to worship idols made of wood. He says that, well, actually, God makes fun of them for doing this. Isaiah explains that what the people were doing was gathering together piles of wood. Half of the wood they would burn to make a fire, and they would prepare a meal on the fire. They would roast their meat, and they would eat their fill. And then he says, they warm themselves and boast that they have a fire and that they're warm. And then from the rest of the wood, Isaiah says, they make an idol. They bow down and worship this wooden idol, saying, Save me, you are my God. The point Isaiah is making here is, he's saying, So you don't think that it's daft to worship a piece of wood? God says, A child, an infant who will come to save the world, this small child is also Almighty God. You don't think that it's daft to worship a piece of wood, but in the eyes of the world, it's foolish to bow down to a child, a baby that you have to feed, wash, and clothe, and then say to the baby, Save me, for you are my God. The Bible tells us that this boy would be God himself. And Jesus was recognized as the mighty God in the flesh when the wise men came and worshipped him. When Jesus helped Peter with the miraculous catch of fish, Peter said, away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. 
And he later confessed that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. When John baptizes Jesus, God himself says, this is my Son. And if you think about it, when God comes to us as a baby, friends, this is the most awesome and powerful event in history. God is all-powerful. So, it's natural that the mighty God can do mighty things. He created the earth, the sun, the moon, the stars. These are the works of our mighty God. So, why is it foolishness then to think that this same mighty God should not be able to take on the flesh and size of a baby. Surely, as we look at Jesus, we are aware of His power, and we're moved to say, we worship Him. We worship our Lord Jesus. We praise Him. This is our Creator. This is our mighty God. It's a matter of faith this baby is God with us, Emmanuel. He is the mighty God, and He lives among us and has become one of us. The title of Everlasting Father given to Jesus should not be confused with the title given to God our Father. It's quite clear, for example, that at Jesus' baptism, that the Father God is a separate person. It was God the Father who said that Jesus was His Son. So, why is it in this verse in Isaiah, He says that the Son would be called the Everlasting Father? Well, usually when you have children, you expect perhaps about 20 years of helping your child to develop into an adult. You expect it to maybe last 20 years or so. It's a time when you have to do everything. You do everything from feeding them, changing nappies, giving baths, providing clothes, helping with homework, sympathizing when they're dumped by their love of their life, encouraging them to choose a career, then paying for the university course that will get them there, and then also providing a washing machine and a tumble dryer and the bank of mum and dad, and so on and so on. But friends, when the child gets into their 20s, you generally start to ask questions like, so, have you thought about getting a place of your own? Or, if that doesn't work, suggesting that you're going to have to start charging them rent. Because you want them to move on. You want them to get on with their life and perhaps become a mother or a father themselves. It's kind of the same thing with Jesus. But when He takes on the role of a father, it's not the same role that God the Father has. As the Son of God, Jesus is going to accomplish the task of dying for the world and taking care of our greatest need. In the same way that a father protects his children, so Jesus protects us from the punishment due for all our sins. He continues to provide for us, his children, through faith, through his death, and resurrection, He's become our provider, the one who takes care of us, our everlasting Father. But the Son's role never changes. He is the one who will take care of us for all eternity. He is the everlasting Father. That's what He was born to be. And finally, the Prince of Peace. When you think about the title Prince, 
you probably think of people like Prince William or Prince Charles. And you don't associate the title necessarily with the person who's right at the top of the tree, because that would normally be the king, or in our case, the queen. But even still, you can't say that a prince is a second-rate citizen. He's still a ruler. He's still in charge. But what kind of ruler is our prince? When Jesus was on earth, he said, don't think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be members of his own household. While Jesus was on earth, his presence brought about the anger and violence of the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They wanted to plot to kill him. When Jesus was born, the angels declared, glory to God in the highest, and on, peace on, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. The peace that this boy would establish was not between nations. The peace that this child would give is not between different races or families, but the peace was between God and man. And the only way that peace could be established was for our sin to be dealt with. So God sent His Son to take our punishment on the cross. He did this to secure a lasting and true peace with a sinful world through the one that we call the Prince of Peace. So, friends, what is the best Christmas present you've ever been given? God gave His Son to everyone who can hear my voice, this wonderful Counselor, the mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This has been laid at the doorstep of your heart. The sad thing is that many people don't want to know Jesus. They look at the gift of this child and it's just another nice idea for Christmas time. They would rather have expensive perfume, designer clothes or, or fancy gadgets. They would rather have Santa Claus. Other folks think that this child didn't come for them. The Jesus laid at their doorstep must be a mistake. He must be for someone else, someone who is more deserving. So they don't find the joy and peace God wants them to have. They don't want to let this child in. So here's the thing. The message from Isaiah the message that tells us about the gift of God's Son should be a message that wants all of us to say, thank you, God. It should make you feel joy in your heart to know that your sins are forgiven, that you're part of His family. It should make you realize that you need the gift of Jesus. To us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. What a wonderful gift he is. To God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, be glory and praise now and forever. Amen. Let's stand and sing again from Mission Praise, time number 211. Hark, the herald angels sing. Mission Praise, number 211.
Together in prayer, let us pray. O God of all goodness and grace, we, we bring our gifts to you this morning with a joyful heart. Grant that with our gifts we may also offer a loving heart and a willing spirit to show clearly in our lives the truth of the gospel as in your service and to your glory we dedicate ourselves and these our offerings through Jesus Christ our Saviour. O Lord God, when we think of everything that you've done for us, that you sent your Son into our world, indeed we scarce can take it in for how great thou art, Heavenly Father. We thank you for the sunrise and the sunset with their brilliant colours of promise. We thank you for the moments of stillness, the, the times when we know peace and tranquility. We thank you for moments of joy and laughter with their sense of hope. We thank you for moments of truth when we know wonder and and we thank you for moments of sadness with tears shed for loved ones. We ask that you would help us to find in each moment your promised gift of life abundant and your presence with us now. O oh Lord, we thank you that you hold us close, that we are aware of your loving arms around us, we thank you that you help us to trust you through and through, that we can be honest with you in our worship, that you allow us to be the people we truly are, with no need to cover up or pretend. And Father, we pray for those who live under constant pressure, under the pressure to succeed, to be somebody that they're not, for those who feel that they've failed, those who feel their guilt has not been washed away. Lord God, we pray for the vulnerable, the, the desperate and the fragile people of this world. Lord, touch them with your Spirit's tenderness and make them complete. We pray for those who are living in relationships that are broken, in families that are damaged or disjointed, help them to mend what is torn. Help them to restore trust once more and touch them with your Spirit's harmony and make them whole. Lord, we come to you only too aware of the poverty and the division in our world, the oppression and the abuse, the the prejudice and the exclusion, the things that are rife across so many lands. Lord, we ask that you would touch those affected, touch them with your spirit of justice and love. And Heavenly Father, we ask now that you would be close to those who have lost family and friends in recent days. May they find in you all the love and all the care and the kindness and comfort they need at this time. And so, Lord, we ask for your courage to be given to all those who put their life in your hands. O oh, gracious God, we bring these prayers to you now in the name of your ever-loving Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We bring our time of worship to a close this morning as we stand and sing from the church hymnary, number 315, Once in Royal David's City.
Remember all that God has done. Rejoice in all that he is doing. Receive all that he has yet to do. And put your trusting hand in his. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, rest upon you and dwell within you this day and evermore.